Now at the end of class last time we raised this question, how many colors are in the rainbow? And we're going to answer that question today and this is basically coming down to a smackdown between Isaac Newton who says seven colors in the rainbow and Pink Floyd and their iconic record cover clearly showed six colors in the rainbow. So who is right? We will answer this question once and for all. By the way, I will say when I start class on Fridays, I typically do Freddy Fridays and I have some uh, Queen music playing. But since I'm going to be talking a lot about indigo today, indigo is going to feature crucially in our discussions but with a song by the indigo girls so i the slide switched over and there would be the indigo girls and i played this song called let it be me and and i thought i would just show you a couple of lyrics from this and i'm not going to try to sing it because i can't do that to justice and also my throat is feeling a bit kind of like sketchy today but the um couple of lines if the world is night, shine my life like a light. In the kind word you speak, in the turn of the cheek, when your vision stays clear in the face of your fear, let it be me. And it's basically a song about in the dark times, let it be me who brings light to the world. And so this is a, a message I wanna share. This is kind of a crazy, crazy time and it's hard for a lot of people. And I wanna encourage us to stay positive and to remember too that whatever your circumstances, there are other people who are struggling as well you have a light that you can bring. So in these difficult times, I would encourage you to bring some light to this world. And I should let you know that you do that for me. The people who have connected with me and give me words of comfort and kindness have meant the world. This has been a challenging time for all of us. And staying connected with you folks has been one of the things that has really kept me going. And one of the things when I look back on it that will make this a most meaningful time. Okay, so back to our smackdown here. We got Isaac Newton in one corner. We got Pink Floyd in the other. How many colors are in the rainbow? Is it the seven colors of Isaac Newton? And we can see the seventh color, a seven color rainbow here. And this is from an illustration from a children's book that I found. Or is it Pink Floyd and the six colors in our iconic album cover picture? Who is correct? This is the story that we're telling today. But first, I want to do an installment of things I like about your generation because there are a great many things I like about your generation. And I would say one of the things that I appreciate the most is that you folks take the circumstances that come to, to you and, and you, you actually handle them with a great deal of grace. Um, during this time, I know people have been sad People have found it difficult, but people aren't complaining. Um, on the whole, I've been quite impressed by how positive you have managed to say it's difficult. Parts of it absolutely suck. We know that that is true, but we know that it's a lot worse for a lot of other people. And people have stayed quite positive and, and, and have tended to look on the good side of things, like the positive things that are coming out of this. I've seen that a lot. You are a generation that accepts circumstances with grace but you also and that's my statement for today about things I like about your generation now before we get too much into the topic today I want to talk a little bit about the homework and we're gonna do just by way of review and actually you might be watching this before you've done the homework but that's okay then it's gonna be a homework preview so let's take a look at this one. This is about a physics instructor who is projecting visible light colors as part of a class demonstration. Okay, so you shine a beam of white light through a diffraction grating and project a pattern on a screen. If you haven't done this before yet, I encourage you to actually draw a picture and see what you're seeing. So I shine a ray of light through a diffraction grating. And we've seen what happens when you do that. You end up getting this series of diffraction at maxima. I get a M equals one spot in the center of the screen. I get a M equals one spot out to the side and I'll get an M equals one on the other side. But if I have a mix of colors, if I have white light, I'm also going to get a different maxima for the different colors. The M is equal to one for the red. It's gonna be bent farther than the M is equal to one or the blue as we've seen. And the question asks this, how wide is this rainbow? What is this physical distance on the screen? I want you to think about that. I want you to draw a picture and think about what different distances, what the different angles correspond to, et cetera, et cetera. You got this. 
Now, this is a one that is like one of my favoritest ever. This was a situation where a, a patient w was having surgery on their arm and they said, as long as we got you opened up on the table, let us study how the sarcomeres in your muscles work. And here's a, a picture of some sarcomeres in a person's muscle. And if you look at it, you've got this structure here where I've got these striations. These things work like a diffraction grating, and when the muscle contracts, and it contracts along this axis, what happens is those ridges get closer, closer together, so your muscles work like a reflection grating, but when you contract the muscle, it changes the spacing of the grating. What? And so it'll change the interference pattern that you get. And so what happened is, this person was bending his wrist back and forth, and they're taking a chunk of muscle. They're shining a laser off of it, and what's happening is the laser is making a variable diffraction pattern and depending upon the spacing of the sarcomeres you would have a smaller angle or a bigger angle and so you'd have a range of different possible angles which is kind of crazy and I want you to think about that that is the physical setup that you're looking at here that's the physical setup that you're looking at here. Very, very interesting kind of thing. And by being able to say something about the diffraction pattern, you can say about something about the maximum and minimal, minimum values of the sarcomere lengths, because the sarcomeres come like stretch between these ridges here. And this is an awesome real world application to a biological system of, of a physics principle. Very, very cool. Now, here's another thing, and th this is just sort of an interesting historical thing. It used to be when people were grading wool fibers, they would use diffraction. So they would take a, a wool fiber, and they would make a diffraction pattern. They would pass a ray of light past it. And then you would end up getting this diffraction pattern on the screen. And remember, for those single slit patterns, you get this fuzzy band in the center. And we looked at the width of that single central maximum, and that told us something about the thickness of the fiber, okay? And so that's something that we can look at. That's what this question was about. Very, very cool thing. Now I wanna talk about some applications of all the things that we've been looking at. And ultimately physics is amazing and cool. And I love the phenomena just as they are. But what's more exciting to me is what they tell us about the world. So we got hummingbirds and their jewel-like colors produced by thin film interference or Check this out. These colors right here in the blue ringed octopus are produced by thin film interference between stacks of reflectant. This is super, super awesome. This is a thin film interference thing. I want you to, if you're solving this problem, to go back, draw a picture. Okay, so here's the situation. I've got plates of reflectant separated by cells. And we're assuming they have an index of refraction of 1.3. Seven. So I got this is my situation. Okay, so there's my cells in the blue. There's my reflected in the green. Ray of light comes in. Some of it reflects off this boundary, and some of it reflects off this boundary, and I can have constructive or destructive interference between these two rays. And we know how to solve problems like this. And the question is this, what is the longest wavelength for constructive interference from opposite sides of the reflectant plates? I'm gonna give you a hint. I'm gonna give you a hint. It's the blue ringed octopus and this amazing blue color, that's where it comes from. And actually in nature, this is the way to produce the brightest, shiniest colors is with this thin film interference. That's why hummingbirds do it. That's why the blue ringed octopus does. So when you calculate their longest wavelength, you are going to get something that is in the blue end of the spectrum. You know that that has to be true. So be watching for that. That's your assessment. So go ahead and draw yourself a picture. Here's my reflectin. Here's my cells on either side, and I'm seeing reflections from the two interfaces. I got my rays coming in, boink, 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 like so, oops, not like that, like this. And I'm gonna look at those reflections and think about the number of reflective phase changes. Remember how that works. How many reflective phase changes will you have? Now, another thing, that you might have seen before. Sometimes you get this corona around the ring, around the moon. You might have seen this before at night. This is very, very cool. And this is a diffraction effect, and it's produced by the droplets. And the droplets make this diffraction pattern. If there was a single color of light, what I would get would be like a central bright spot, and then I would get 
a dark spot, then I would get other things, and I would see these like diffraction patterns as we've seen around rings. But the thing is, um, in I get an image that's in color because white light, which is reflecting off of the moon, is made up of a mix of different colors, and so I get different patterns that are superimposed, and so I get these awesome, awesome rings. But actually, people use this phenomenon to measure the size of droplets in fog. They shine a laser into the fog and look at the resulting diffraction pattern that you have, and that can tell you something about the size of the droplets. And how big are droplets in fog? Tiny, tiny, tiny. So when you calculate this one, think about this pattern, and we were told if you know the size of this central maximum, you can relate that to the size of the thing that produces the effect. So draw a picture for it, make sure you know what all the distances correspond to, see what you get, and your assessment is this better be a tiny, tiny, tiny little droplet. Now. I want to think about this one too. This is the one where you're asked to trace rays of light and see how you can get this double image of a fish. And what we want to do is make a top view of the situation and trace a path of some of the light rays to show how this can happen. And this is one where I actually want you to sit down and actually want you to draw the picture. I want you to draw the rays of light and see how they react when they reach boundaries and see what happens. And you'll do something like this. So here's the fish tank. Okay, the person is looking from over here, so here's where the person is looking from. I have a single fish, and the single fish is right here. Rays of light come from the fish, and they go towards the edge of the fish tank. So a ray of light comes in like so. And when it hits that boundary, it refracts. And it refracts to a bigger angle. So when it comes out the other side, it gets bent to a bigger angle. And so it goes like so. And as you can see, as I've drawn it, that ray of light is going towards the person's eye. Over here on the other side, I get a ray of light that comes to the edge of the tank. And again, I draw a perpendicular. I draw a normal to the wall of the tank. And then the ray of light refracts and it refracts so it's at a bigger angle. And again, that means it's coming towards the person's eye. So rays of light come out both sides of the tank towards the person's eye. And if you want to see where something is, the way your eye does is it just traces the ray of light back and sees where it appears to come from. And so from the person's point of view, you're going to see one fish over here, and you're going to see a second fish over here. Because you're going to see two images, rays of light appear like they come from those two different places. That's the crux of the biscuit. That's how this happens. And it brings up this idea that the way we locate something in space is we trace rays of light and see where they appear to come from. Now I want to come back to this idea about how you make a rainbow, or come to this idea about how you make a rainbow. We want to know how many colors in the rainbow. Well, first let's talk about how you make a rainbow. And there's a couple of different things that happen. First off, we have to remember the idea of index of refraction. Index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in a material, and different materials have different indices of refraction, as we've seen. And if the index of refraction changes at the interface, there is a reflection. So I get a reflection of rays of light in this surface of this pond. And this was an image I took at a high altitude pond, and I tried really, really, really hard to keep my dog from jumping in the water and disturbing the reflection until I could get the picture. And as soon as I'd snap that picture, the dog was in the water. And so then I wasn't getting something so so pretty after that. But I get a reflection at the surface of the water because there's a variation in the index of refraction. I always get that at an interface with a difference in index. If there's no change in the index of refraction, there is no reflection. And this is a point that we will come back to. This is a point we'll come back to. But before we do that, I want to look at how do you make, how do you get mirages like this? Here's a picture that looks like we have these wildebeest, and it looks like they're in water. There is no water in this picture. They're out on the grasslands, and there's a pocket of hot air near the ground. They're in a low-lying spot, and there's hot air there. Hot air has a lower index of refraction than the cooler air above it, and so rays of light come in, and they bounce off it, and they get a reflection off of this pool of hot air, just like I would get a refra reflection off the surface of water. And you have seen this sort of um, situation before. You've seen this sort of mirage.
you've seen this situation where you've seen really dry landscapes and it looks like there's water but there isn't that's the classic desert mirage you think there's water up ahead but as you go closer and closer it just recedes further and further away there is no water in this picture and you've seen it before on roads and i've got this great video that i took when I was up in Wyoming on a cold day with hot sun and I measured this amazing heat shimmer off the surface of a road. It was a very, very cool thing. And if you look, the cars, their headlights bounce off it too. And that was the piece that kind of like struck me the most. Very, very cool thing. Now I want to talk about how you make a rainbow. That's kind of our next thing. How do we actually do that? Because I want to talk about how many colors in the rainbow. Well, how do you make one? If I've got a droplet of water, and sunlight comes into it. When it enters, I get a bit of refraction here and there's dispersion. I have a different index of refraction for different colors, which spreads out the light into a rainbow. And then there's a reflection at this back surface. Then when it comes out back out, I get more dispersion. As a consequence, I end up breaking the light into even more colors. Now think about this. The way this would actually be happening would be this. The sun is over here. Here's Mr. Sun. Okay, over here, rays of light are coming out of the sun, hitting a droplet, and they're coming down towards you. You're down here. So you're looking up in the sky towards the sky where there are water droplets. The sun is going to be behind you. That's the thing. The sun is behind you. The droplets are in front of you. The light is coming back towards you. And if the angle is just right, you're going to see different colors. And a rainbow is actually a mosaic. A, a droplet at a particular place in the sky will reflect a particular color back towards you. And the high droplets reflect the red. The low droplets reflect the blue. So I end up with a rainbow that's red on the top and it's blue on the bottom. And I just end up having a droplet at the right spot where the angles are just so as to reflect the droplets of light back, uh, to, to reflect the rays of light back to you for the different colors. But a rainbow is a mosaic. Each droplet just sends one color towards you. Now I want you to take a moment, I want you to pause and take a look at this little video about making rainbows. We did this with some neighbor kids on my block and it was like one of the most fun things I ever did. And we just got out some hoses and it was a sunny day and we were using hoses to make rainbows. And if you have the sun behind you and you spray light, spray water in front of you, you can make a rainbow anytime that you want. So go ahead and take a look at this little making rainbows video because it's devilishly cute. This has got a coefficient of cuteness. I think that's a, uh, I think we use the C for that. That's the coefficient of cuteness that is just off the charts and you need to see this video. Now I want to talk about something else that happens with water droplets and light and that's the idea of scattering. Okay, when I have rays of light hit like a droplet of water, you're going to get a fair amount of scattering off of it. A lot of it is, instead of going into the drop, it's going to reflect from the surface and it's going to reflect in all directions. That's why we call it scattering. Now clouds are made up of water droplets and so I have water droplets in clouds and the cloud droplets are much bigger than the wavelength of light so as a consequence they are large objects as far as light is concerned and they scatter all the colors more or less equally so light comes and hits the droplets in clouds and the clouds appear white and the clouds appear white because sunlight appears white and that is true of scattering from large objects. Now it turns out your skin is basically made of different materials that are transparent, but they have differing index, indices of refraction. You are basically made out of collagen and water, your skin is, and the collagen bundles are clear and the water is clear, but you have different index of refraction, so you have scattering. And so if there's no pigment in your skin, your skin appears white. And here's some um, African babies who lack skin pigment. And, and you can see their skin appears white and it appears white because it's scattering and the color they act, the skin actually is, is transparent. It's made up of transparent materials. Clouds appear white because of scattering. Skin with no pigment appears white and it appears white because of scattering. You're basically made of transparent materials. But if we can take your skin and we can adjust the index or refraction of the materials that it's made out of, you can make the skin appear transparent. And that's what's happening in these fish right here. These, these uh, ghost knife, oh no, these are glass cats, glass catfish. Um, you can see they, they appear transparent. They've just basically balanced the index of refraction of the different 
components of their body and as a consequence they appear transparent except for their swim bladder which you can see right here and that appears silvery that's total internal reflection because there is air inside there here is this amazing experiment that was done with rat skin so he took this little thing here and put it underneath the skin of a rat and it looked like this and then it was injected with glycerin which matched the index of refraction of the collagen to the fluids that surround it and you the person who was doing this investigation was able to make the skin basically transparent it would be possible to have like <laughs> injections that would render your skin actually transparent which is kind of an amazing amazing thing you're just balancing the indices of refraction but you are made of transparent materials and your skin if there's no pigment it just appears white because of the scattering if there is pigment it appears colorful because of the pigment one place in nature where pigment is not found is in polar bear fur and polar bear fur is actually not white it is transparent the reason it appears white is because of scattering but the shafts of the hair are individually they are transparent and another place where you find such things in nature is my hair my hair actually if you look at a shaft under a microscope it is transparent it used to have brown color in it now it doesn't and it appears white because of scattering my hair is white the same way that clouds are white which is which is really really kind of like awesome oh by the way too and if, if i take some of my hair and i put it on a microscope slide and put the right oil on it i can make it appear as if it vanishes which is kind of awesome and so i want to do that for halloween someday i want to have some like gel that i put in my hair that renders my hair actually transparent it's a life goal now, if you have small objects like air molecules, light scatters off of air molecules, but air molecules are much, much smaller than the wavelength of light, so they're small objects. And so short wavelengths scatter more, and the variation between scattering of different wavelengths is extremely strong. And so the sky appears blue because it's the blue light that scatters from the molecules of air in the sky. I want you to take a look at this video right here, which is called IR veins. It turns out your skin is made of transparent materials and you have scattering because of that. But it turns out the things that are doing the scattering are not as large as cloud droplets. And so as a consequence, there's a wavelength dependence. And it turns out red light scatters less and infrared light even less. And infrared light doesn't scatter very much. And you are largely transparent to infrared. And so you can use infrared to see through your skin and actually into your veins. And what you see is not the vein itself. You see the blood inside your vein. And this is one of the things we have inside the, in the Little Shop of Physics. You won't have a chance to see it in person but you will get a chance to see this awesome video and this was something we made and the person who, who was putting her hand underneath the camera so you could see her veins her name was Dana but we called her Vena just because her veins look so amazing and it just turns out you are made of largely transparent materials long wavelengths there's less scattering and you are largely transparent to the infrared it's kind of a phenomenal thing now if you look at the scattering from small objects, you say it's strongly dependent upon wavelength. Lots of scattering for the short wavelengths, very little scattering for the long wavelengths. And so as a consequence, you see blue skies. And at sunset, when the light is coming through the atmosphere, all the short wavelengths get scattered out and what you're left with is red. And so the scattering of the, of the light by air molecules gives us the blue skies and red sunsets. Here's something I want you to notice. Next time it snows, and it's in Colorado, so could be next week, could be next year, we have no idea, but next time it snows, take a look at your shadow and ask yourself this, what color is your shadow? What color is your shadow? Right here, the direct light from the sun is blocked, and this shadow is actually blue. This is actually, I grabbed this from the image that was on the previous slide, and it is distinctly blue. That oval, was exactly in my shadow where I was standing. The color of a shadow is blue. And I want you to take a picture and you can see that. You don't notice it so much um, in, in, in regular life, but if you take a picture and you isolate the, 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 the little shadowy bit is clearly blue and it's because that was where my body was blocking the rays of light. My shadow was blocking it here. That was not a very good picture of me. Here we go. 
my shadow was blocking oh that's terrible too my artistry is just not going to work here today but my my body was kind of like laying a swath of shadow on the ground but what i was blocking was the direct rays of light but i was getting light from the side from the sky and the light from the sky is blue and so my shadow is blue after sunset you still get light that comes in. And the only light that you can get after sunset, like if you over, over, over here, is rays of light that bounce off the atmosphere. And the rays of light that bounce off the atmosphere are the short wavelength ones, like the blue, but also the ultraviolet. And so the last color to leave the sky when the sun sets is blue. And here's a picture I took on a little shop of physics tri trip and we had a camera that didn't have automatic white balance. You had to set it and we set the white balance to daylight. So it's expecting daylight. And I came out and I took a picture at Carhenge and I didn't correct it for sunset. And I'm glad I didn't because I got this picture and the picture appears blue because the last color to leave the sky after the sun sets is blue. And so I got this amazing blue image and it didn't look like that because your eyes adjust to the color balance. But doggone it, it was blue, blue, blue as the camera reveals. And since there's a lot of short wavelengths, there's a lot of blue, but there's a lot of ultraviolet. And that's why Ken, and some of you might know Ken from the labs, he's the mustache guy. Ken likes to wear things which are fluorescent. And Ken was wearing a fluorescent vest and it's glowing because there's a lot of ultraviolet that is still coming from the sky. It's mostly blue, but there's also some UV. And here's me not looking nearly as cool with my not fluorescent stuff. Although sometimes I do use shampoo that has fluorescent dyes in it for reasons I won't go into right now, but it's kind of awesome. Now, if you are out on a sunny day and you are standing in the shade of an umbrella, you are getting sunburned because the ultraviolet comes from the sky and it's coming in around the sides of the umbrella. If you can see the sky, you are getting burned. And if you're directly underneath a rainbow, that's equivalent to wearing about SPF2. That's blocking half the rays of ultraviolet from the sun. On Mars, and I'm just bringing this up and I want you just to kind of like know this is true. The sunset is blue and the sky is red. And that, I just, I'm not going to go into why that's true, but it's kind of awesome. And the physics is just a little bit different and super awesome. Now, here's some things which are blue, but they have no pigment in them. My wife's eyes, why are they blue? She has lovely blue eyes. They are blue because the melanocytes in the eye, they're little cells that should hold melanin. They don't have any melanin in them. They are empty of pigment, but instead what they do is they scatter and they scatter light. And so the blue of Carol's eyes is exactly the same as the blue of the sky, which is a very, very awesome thing. And also this blue bird right here, no blue pigment. They're scattering from particles in the feathers. Oh, you know what else has that? Colorado blue spruce, so many things. Um, or may get their blue color from scattering. The blue morpho butterfly has this structural color, which is insane. And if you've ever seen one, they have this amazing shimmery blue color. And it comes from reflections from these stacks of cells that look like this. There's a picture of these in your textbook. And I get multiple reflections from these stacks of these plates. And, it produce, and it, you end up kind of like wiping out all but a very specific wavelength and you get amazing iridescent color. So here's four different ways to be blue. Blue eyes, scattering. Right here on the neck of this bird, this is thin film interference. I've got the structural color of the blue morpho butterfly. Or else I've got the columbine. And the columbine is actually blue because there's actually, I think there's actually some pigment in there. Crazy, crazy, but there's lots of different ways to be blue. But mostly when you see blue in nature, it is produced by some sort of structure. Now, back to the story, which we started at the start of class. How many colors are in the rainbow? Okay, how many colors are in the rainbow? And this is a really, really fascinating story. It's one I just love to tell. So, if you look at pictures, pictures show about four, and this is one that's from the textbook, and it looks like there's like, there's a red, there's a yellow, there's a green, there's a blue. Um, if you look at this table in the textbook, there's just six, but that's just because Randy Knight, you know, he's kind of a pedant, and he divided the spectrum into just like 50 nanometer swaths. So that's why we ended up with that. There is no rhyme or reason, so forget, forget that. There are three color sensors in your eye. 
There are red cones, green cones, and blue cones. There are three different color sensors. And fundamentally, the, current, the appearance of the rainbow is a biological, not a physical phenomenon. It's determined by our color sensitivity. And we have three color sensors in our eye. And the three color sensors peak in different parts of the spectrum. We have the blue peaked in the blue. We have the green peaked in the middle of the spectrum. We have the red peaked at the long wavelength end of the spectrum. There are three different cones and they're tuned to two diff three different photon energies. And so we're sensitive to different swaths of the spectrum. And we make our perception of color by seeing how much each one of these cones is stimulated. Even stimulation of the red and the green and the blue looks white. More stimulation of the blue, it looks blue, etc., etc. So if you look at a rainbow in the sky, how many colors do you see? And I want you just to take a look at this and pretend you're the first person ever seeing a rainbow and you're going to divide it up into bands. And what I see is three really broad swaths of color. There's kind of a red band here. There's kind of a greenish band in the middle and there's kind of a bluish band over here. You can break it up into finer increments, but these are definitely the red cones, the green cones, the blue cones. They have three broad swaths of color. The, in between that, you can break it into finer things where they overlap a little bit. But if you were to take that rainbow and break it up into bands of color, how many bands of color do you see? Now, Isaac Newton, in his published work, showed seven colors. He's got the Roy G. Biv that we've seen, the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, the indigo, and the Violet. We're going to call it Violet, so it's Roy G. Biv as opposed to Roy G. Bip. But in fact, this was a fiction. If you looked at Isaac Newton's early work, it didn't look like this. It wasn't this like grand old band of science holding up this prism and kind of like breaking the light up into a spectrum. It wasn't this picture which we see in in textbooks where you have like Isaac Newton breaking in this amazing prism and breaking up the light into a spectrum. It wasn't that tidy. What he did was not this. So he had this situation where he had the rays of light coming in the window and then they were had a prism here which broke the light up into a spectrum that was projected on the wall and look at how many dots of colors you see. One, two, three, four and five. Isaac Newton originally re recorded five colors. That was original data. Oh, by the way, when was he doing these experiments? He was doing these experiments when he couldn't be at the university because of a pandemic. In that case, it was the plague, which was, you know, pretty serious and pretty nasty. And so Isaac Newton, during his time away from school, because he had to uh, social distance, did some experiments on light, also thought about gravity, it's a, and developed calculus and other kinds of things. But one thing he did is he played with, with prisms and did some experiments with light. And his original investigations were five colors. But when he published, he wasn't content with those five colors. When he published, he said there were seven because he wanted the colors to correspond to the notes of the musical scale, the A, B, C, D, E, F, and G of our musical scale. And he also wanted them to correspond with the seven naked eye planets. If you include the Earth, uh, the Sun, and the Moon as, as planets, which astrologers did at the time, you've got Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and the Sun and the Moon, which is why we have seven days of the week. They are named after the seven planets. It's more clear if you think about their names in Spanish. You've got Lunes, uh, named after the Moon. You've got Martes, named after Mars. You've got Miércoles, named after Mercury. You've got Jueves, named after Jupiter. You've got Viernes, named after Venus. You've got Sabado, named after Saturn. They're named after the days of the week are named after the planets. And Sunday, well, that's a pretty obvious one what that one's named after. But they're named after the planets. So there's seven naked eye planets. There's seven holes in the human head. You got your two eyes, you got your two ears, you got your two nostrils, you got your mouth. You got your seven notes in the musical scale. Seven was a really mystical number for, num for, for numerology and Newton was big into numerology. And so he said, if I'm gonna take the rainbow and be the first person who publishes it, I'm not gonna list the colors I originally saw, which was red, yellow, green, blue, and purple. I need to add two more colors so that I can get them up to seven, not five. Newton said, oh no, not five. I need seven so that it matches all these other mystical things. And so he made up 
two extra colors. And he said, oh, a friend told me that he saw some orange in here. He said, I'm, a friend told me orange, and s somehow, too, he, saw, he added an indigo in here. Now, if you ask me to look at the spectrum and actually look at a rainbow, you can convince me that there is orange, but you cannot convince me that there is any indigo in the spectrum. I do not see it. And if you look at different cultures who have not been taught Roy G. Biv and say how many colors in the rainbow, some cultures say three, some say four, some say five, some say six, but there is nobody who has not been exposed to the Roy G. Biv model of things who says there's indigo. There is no indigo in the spectrum. Indigo is an awesome color. I love indigo. I love indigo snakes. I love the indigo girls, but there is no indigo in the rainbow. Now, if you were to show me a rainbow flag, I will judge you based on this. Peace, here's the peace flag, pache, that's for peace. The peace flag, peace, I'm a big fan, huge fan. Look at the colors, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh, fail, fail, they've got a seven color rainbow flag. Not, not good, not good, not good. But another thing that they've done is this. If you look at a rainbow in the sky, it's red on the top. It is blue down below. And so you better get the number of colors right and you better get them in the right order. Rainbows are red on the top. South Africa, the rainbow nation, so close. It's six colors. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, just as it should be, except you've got red on the bottom. South Africa, the rainbow nation, so close. Turn that button upside down and I will turn my frown upside down. Oh, yes. The one organization I found that gets it right. Check this out. The GLBTQ banner. Oh, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six colors. Absolutely as it should be with red on the top. So well played. Well played. So how many colors are in the rainbow? Pink Floyd versus Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton said seven, but he cooked the books and he changed his original data to match his perception as opposed to what he actually saw. And that is a distinct scientist note. There are not seven colors in the rainbow. There are not the seven colors that he reported. And that's kind of a big deal because what Isaac Newton did, he was a brilliant man, did a lot of amazing things. But one place where I think he kind of like let us down was he said, I'm gonna take a look at this phenomenon and I'm gonna report what I want there to be as opposed to what my senses actually told me. Pink Floyd got it right. This is actually fairly close to what you would see. This is a fairly naturalistic representation of a rainbow. And I'm starting this social movement. I'm calling this the indigo resistance. And the indigo resistance is a group of people who says, we need to base our perceptions of the world, not on how we think the world should be, but in science. We need to use science to inform our decisions. We need science to inform our actions. We need science and observations and real data about the world to make decisions about what we do next. We need to see the world as it is, not as we would prefer it to be. This is the indigo resistance. And it begins with acceptance. Let's accept the world as it is. This is the world as it is. It is the way that our eyes and our ears and our senses and our scientific instruments tell it it is. That is the world as it is. And let us not change the data to match our perceptions. But also let us never stop imagining an even better tomorrow. This is the second part of the indigo resistance. We are going to accept the world as it is, but we are going to always, always keep imagining, keep striving for an even better tomorrow. Now that indigo resistance, that's just thing I, I, something I joke about, but something I don't want to joke about is this. The world is in a difficult state right now. We know this. There's a lot of challenges facing us. And to solve the problems facing us, we need a full spectrum of voices. We need everybody at the table. We need diversity. We need people with different experiences, with different ways of looking at the world, with different stories that they've learned when they're growing up. We need everybody at the table. We need you. 
If you are here at Colorado State University, you have earned your seat here. You are learning amazing things. You are developing your intellect. You're developing your heart. You are a person that we need, and we need you to help solve the problems of the world going forward. We need a full spectrum of voices, and we need you. Now let's talk about what comes next. Next, we're gonna talk about lenses and images. And this is kind of awesome. Check it out. Droplets of water captured in a spider web. They themselves have captured rays of light and make a wonderful image of what's behind it. This is what's ahead next week. I hope you folks have an amazing rest of your week, rest of your weekend, and I'll talk to you next week.